Welcome, everyone. I want to start by just um, giving a big thanks to the people that are co-sponsoring this event, um, the Watson Institute for hosting us, the Taubman Center for um, American Policy and Politics, and the Sociology Department. Um, and really welcome back to everyone, because this is also the first uh, big event for the sociology community. Um, we are going to just um, a plug to stay for the talk and join us for a reception after the talk um, that will be taking place right outside um, this room. So um, it really is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tom Dupreet, who basically doesn't need a huge introduction because you've all probably read his work already. Um, Tom Dupreet is Giddings Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, where he's also the co-director for the Institute of Social and Economic Research and Policy co-director of the Center for the Study of Wealth and Inequality, and a faculty member of the Columbia Population Center. Tom is today one of today's leading experts on social stratification and inequality, having tackled some of today's most pressing social questions, including gender differences in educational performance, educational attainment, and fields of study, the determinants of college persistence and dropout in the US, a comparative study of how educational expansion and the structure of linkages between education and the labor market contribute to earnings inequality across a range of industrialized countries, and the study of how social comparison processes affect the compensation of corporate executives. Papers resulting from these projects have been published in leading journals in sociology as well as in leading journals in management and public policy. It's, in fact, nearly impossible, I think, to pick up one of today's uh, leading sociology journals and not find an article by Tom or by one of his many talented graduate students. I routinely hear Tom's students describe him as the best mentor they've ever had, so I think it's fair to say that his impact goes well beyond his impressive body of research. In fact, I once heard the late Diva Pedro, herself a giant in the field of sociology and public policy, describe teaching a class on social inequality. She said, she often felt like she was teaching, quote, the sociology of Tom Dupreet. Um, I could go on and on, but the reason you're here is to hear from Tom directly. So without further, further ado, I'll turn this over to Tom, who's going to be talking today about school to work linkages, educational mismatches, and labor market outcomes. So thanks very much for your kind words. Um, let me just get organized in terms of what I'm going to look at and look at you. I just, okay. So I think I understand this. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk today about this um, project that has been occupying um, a good portion of my time for now a few years, actually. This actually started, um, I, was a, I was given a research professor position at the University of Amsterdam for three years. And this must have been like five or six years ago. Uh, and the idea was that I would um, I would teach part of a course, but we would also come up with a research project. Uh, and uh, I had um, at this point I had like, finished the book, the gender um, uh, the gender gap book with Claudia Bookman, uh, and um, one of the things that you know, of course we showed in the book was is that you know women are getting more education than men. It wasn't always the case, but um, uh, it is the case now. And uh, that uh, this advantage grew uh, through college as well as before college. Um, and the, it, but the thing that was sort of like, you know, re really impressed me was how few people who start post-secondary education finish it in the US. Uh, and uh, you know the rate of non-completion is very high, and then the question is like, why? Um, and of course, there's like three kinds of reasons people sort of know at some level. I mean, they, we don't know like in, you know, we don't know as much as we want, but we have you know some ideas that well, you know, post-secondary education is really expensive in the United States, and so that's going to be a problem. And um, educational preparation for post-secondary education isn't uniformly strong, and so that's going to create dropout risk. You know, but the third thing is is that, you know, the United States has an educational system that um, doesn't always provide clear pathways between school and work. And so, you know, for a lot of people that are in post-secondary education and trying to figure out what they're going to do with it, uh, and for various reasons, it might be hard, and for various, and, and it might be expensive, and so um, 
you know, so that got, um, you know, me thinking about this issue of schoolwork linkages, um, and uh, uh, Herman van der Verforst was running the, um, the institute that I was staying at. And Thijs Bol actually was a graduate student, and he was in the class that I taught on causal models. Uh, and so you, you know, you, you, you find collaborators through these various kinds of mechanisms. And so that's all I did this project, which continues. So I'm going to talk primarily about the ASR paper that, that came out recently, but I'm going to provide context for some other things that we're doing. Um, and, you know, you can interrupt me as you, as you like. Okay, so this paper came out recently uh, in ASR. Uh, Christina um, uh, Kiocha Eller is, um, was my student at Columbia. She's just started at Harvard two weeks ago. Um, I think she's teaching too much, but that's, <laughs> that, that's not a topic for now. <laughs> I just asked her how things are going. And she talked about, in any case, I mean, she's an excellent teacher. Um, okay, so uh, you know, so let's let's get into the meat here. Okay, so you know, the question that we're addressing is how education affects the wage distribution, uh, and you know, we you know we know the that you know this matters in various ways, and one of the ways it matters is through the through the population distribution of educational attainment, uh, and uh, it you know centrally matters through the issue of the rate of return. To, uh, educational level in more recently field of study and you know inequality has been rising and one of the components of this is rising returns to education so you know this is a standard way of studying um, education and its impacts and inequality and other educational features play important roles but they're you know they're, they're, they're less studied and so this is our, our focus today our macro and micro aspects of the structure of linkage between educational outcomes and occupational positions and you know my my like my, my first goal today is by the end of this talk, everyone should understand what, um, what, I, what we mean by this notion of linkage structure. We're interested in what it is and does it matter, and we think it does matter, and we're going to sort of explain that. Okay. Um, now, you know, I'm a sociologist, and sociologists, you know, focus on institutions and the consequences of institutions. Uh, and those of you that are education scholars in the room know this, and the others can readily appreciate that sociologists for uh, a long time have been interested in institutional features of educational systems and their effects. Um, Jutta Amendinger, who was a student of Karl Ludwig Meyer, um, uh, Alan Kirchhoff, who was my longtime colleague at Duke, um, Yossi Shavit and Walter Mueller, um, who were running something called the Kasman Project. Um, as it applied to education. So people know that Erickson and Goldthorpe uh, did a Kasman project um, on occupational, um, on, on, the, on, on social class mobility. Uh, I think it's less well known that there was also a corresponding Kasman project. Um, Kasman stands for Comparative Analysis of Social Mobility in Industrialized Nations that focused on education. Um, and uh, and Shavit Mueller uh, uh, assembled a team of scholars and wrote a book that came out, I think, in 2000. Um, uh, and they, and Kirchhoff and Almendinger, um, all focused on these national differences in educational systems in terms of trying to make sense of what, you know, how does education matter and how does it matter, why does it matter, does it matter differently in different countries, and if so, or for that matter, over time, and if so, why? Uh, and they identified a set of like dimensions of macro structure that they asserted mattered. Okay, uh, and you know, and the three most important of these dimensions are what were called standardization, stratification, and vocational specificity. So standardization is the extent to which the educational system is the same all over the country because of rules. Um, stratification is the extent to which people get tracked in this system at earlier versus later ages. So the German system is quite stratified because people went from, um, they went from uh, the, uh, the, the Grinschule, the elementary school, they had to then choose it or, or were assigned to different tracks, whether assigned to an academic track or a vocational track that happened early. But these things were treated as aggregate country level features. Okay, so the focus, it was a macro structural approach. Uh, and there were all these papers that were done uh, and, uh, uh, by a variety of scholars, including a set of people in the context of this Kasman project, 
that basically look for evidence that these characteristics affected the school to work transition, like the time to first job or the unemployment rate, and they, these things were put into analyses as country level variables. Um, and so, you know, the assertion that, you know, we make is, is that this macrostructural approach um, is powerful, but it's, 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 it's incomplete, okay? Uh, and it's incomplete in a couple of ways. So, it, you know, one is it leaves out the relational story, okay? That the Kasman and all work addressed only implicitly the ways that educational outcomes connect to occupational destinations. Um, you know, going back over here, you know, those are characteristics of an educational system. So the question of like, what do they imply about the, um, about the transition, about the jobs people may uh, um, come into, that is not, it's not part of the scheme itself. There's predictions about it, but it's not part of the scheme, okay? Uh, and, you know, we argue that national educational systems differ in the extent to which they create weak or strong linkage between school leaving credentials and occupations. Uh, and these, and there are multiple pathways, pathways from different credentials, and that implies a distribution of linkage strengths. Uh, if countries have dozens, in some cases hundreds, the German system has hundreds of ways of leaving the school system, and the question of how those connect to the labor market, um, well, in general, they will connect differently. So it implies that there's going to be variation um, by educational outcome within country. Uh, and it implies there's going to be variation in linkage strength for the same outcome across countries, which means that there's an intermediate level of structure that is uh, sort of necessarily ignored by approaches, which were the standard approaches, of trying to make sense of country differences, which focused on these country level attributes. Country level attributes can't pick these things up. Okay, so that was our, that was our focus. Now there is or has been a relational literature that's existed uh, for some years, um, but this relational focus was micro focus rather than, rather than, um, um, rather than structural. Uh, and it goes back um, arguably to the book that Richard Freeman wrote in 1976 called The Overeducated American, which is a book that, um, you know, was all about the fact that was sort of people of my, you know, of my, of my generation, uh, that in some sense is sort of maybe this book is sort of lost and it's sort of surprising and it seems like wrong now, okay, but it was observed by Freeman who wrote this book in the 70s, which we experienced actually uh, coming out of college that college degrees didn't seem to be worth very much. Uh, and so that's why he wrote this book, The Overeducated over American. Why weren't they worth very much? And again, the, you know, there may be economists in the room, and so you know, Economics 101 will tell you that you, know, that you have to focus on supply as well as demand. And you had this baby boom that was hitting the labor market sort of all at once that was magnified by the fact that there were all these um, men uh, of that, you know, generation that were trying to not go to Vietnam. Uh, and so the way you tried to stay out of Vietnam, one of the ways was to stay in school as long as you can. And then you had this massive spill into the labor market. Uh, and so, you know, I went to MIT and I had friends who were driving taxis. And I mean, it was, you know, there were, there were not enough jobs for all of us. And so Freeman wrote this book. Now, it, you know, in reality, probably the return to college was, you know, the, the maybe was rising all through this and was masked by the over by the oversupply. Okay, um, but then Duncan and Hoffman wrote a paper later that um, took this notion of overeducated overeducation and created a scheme for it. Uh, that you know, if you want to find out what the rate of return to education is that, you know, maybe you should pay attention to not the education of the person, but rather the education of the person and some interaction with the education required for the person's job. And so if you take a person in a particular occupation uh, and they have a certain amount of education and you ask the question, do they match? And if they don't match, then there's going to be a difference, either positive or negative difference that's left. Uh, if they have more education than it would seem you need for that job, then there is an overeducation component. And if they have less education than it would seem for that job, there's an undereducation component. And so what Duncan and Hoffman asked is, well, 
do you get the same return to the overeducation or the undereducation component that you get to the required education component? And the answer was not in general. Um, and this became something of great interest, especially to Europeans, which in, in vocational systems there was more acceptance of the idea that there could be too much education because it make, interferes with people matching. Okay? Um, and then there's this notion of horizontal mismatch. And the first paper that I know of that addressed issues of horizontal mismatch, and there's now a literature that's developed around this, was actually by Jim Witte, who was a graduate student of Arne Kalberg's in, um, at UNC. Uh, and uh, he was spending lots of time in Germany when, uh, when I was spending time in Germany. And he was very interested in sort of in, in anal and studying Germany. The German socioeconomic panel had started coming out started in the 80s, uh, and it, it had questions of uh, the respondents as to whether they felt that their skills were being used in the jobs they were in, which allowed him to study horizontal mismatch, that is people at the same educational level who e either were in jobs where the skills were being used by the jobs or were said they were in jobs where the skills weren't being used in the jobs, and the question is did that did that matter? And actually, it was sort of remarkable how many Germans were saying they were mismatched, given the sort of the presumption is that the German system would match everybody correctly. Okay? Uh, and then this has gotten picked up in the economics literature, and a variety of people have looked at this possibility of mismatch between skills and occupations. And then the question is, what does mismatch mean? And there's various criteria that are used. Would you use self-reports? Uh, there are normative criteria that are used having to do with people, with scholars looking at jobs, looking at educational fields of study and saying this matches to this, this matches, this doesn't match, um, you know, or various statistical criteria. Now all of this focuses attention on the individual worker rather than on structure, okay? And then it begs the question of structural effects. In other words, it ask, begs the question, does structure matter apart from its effect on matching? Or to put it more, you know, in for example terms, is the German educational system different from the American educational system in that it does a better job of matching um, school leavers to jobs? And so, if if the German system is different, and if that difference matters, or in other words, if uh, standardization, stratification, and vocational specificity matter, do they matter because they have an impact? on the proportion of people that are matched as opposed to mismatched. Is that all that's going on? You know, or does structure matter apart from its effect on matching? So that it was, our, it was our question, okay? And so our focus was, we focus on structure as well as the individual, and our structural focus is at the level of pathways rather than as well as at the level of countries. And we're interested in the question of whether and how structure as well as individual matches and mismatches affect labor market outcomes. So that's, um, uh, that's the project. And we, you know, we ask a set of questions. So we ask whether returns to specific educational credentials are a function of the strength and pattern of linkage to occupations. We ask, do the benefits and costs of achieving a match or mismatch between credentials and job depend upon how strongly that credential links to the occupational structure? We asked, how does the structure of linkage affect unemployment risk and changes in this risk over time and over the life course? Uh, and you know, so you know, just to sort of you know, pre is is so there are people in the world who think that vocational educational systems and this word is a bad word actually because in an American context, when I say vocational, people think of like like relatively low levels of education, okay? Whereas like doctors are vocational, lawyers are vocational. You're go to law school, you learn how to be a lawyer. You go to um, make, you know, car mechanic school, you become a car mechanic. The fact that one is low and one is high is an important distinction, right? But it doesn't necessarily make one more vocational than another. Of course, you know, doctors don't want to be called vocational, they're called professional. But those are, you know, there's the politics of what, what, whatever you want to call it, OK? Um, and, you know, and so, there are people that, you know, think that, like, you know, too much linkage is bad, okay? Uh, and so we're getting, you know, get at this issue. So, like, uh, I, I, I might reflexively, some might reflexively say linkage is good. So why is linkage good? 
because it provides like clear paths to get from people from school to work. So that's good, right? So why might linkage be bad? Well, some might argue that it creates inflexibility. It creates rigidity. Rigidity is fine in a static world. We don't live in a static world. We live in a dynamic world. And in a dynamic world, if you have a rigid system that like trains people for particular jobs that 30 years later don't exist, what happens to these people? Okay. That, so again, I'm telling a story. Okay, I mean, it's a coherent story, whether it's right or not, it's okay. Because it's a story that basically, in some respects, goes back to Gary Becker and goes back to this notion of you know, specific and general human capital. And you know, the argument is well, specific human capital is for specific things and general human capital is for lots of things. And then there's a kind of a presumption of a zero sum component here that if you got a lot of specific human capital, you probably didn't get as much general human capital. So too much specific human capital makes you inflexible. Right. I mean, of course, it begs a lot of questions, but I mean, you see a logic that leads to the conclusion that in a, in a dynamic world, you want people who are generally trained. And in a static world, you know, you want them specifically trained. And so in the real world, there are going to be trade-offs, so to speak. And so which one is better? Who knows? Okay. Um, and, you know, so, you know, we have, you know, there were some, you know, findings from the linkage uh, project. So we, and the AJS paper that, you know, got published in 2017 showed that countries differ in their linkage structure uh, and that these differences themselves differ depending upon the specific educational outcome under study. In other words, it's not the case that country A has stronger linkage than country B, that that question is like improperly framed because the linkage isn't at the country level, it's at the level of individual pathways. And so maybe on average it does, but the question of like, what's the distribution? Now, if you go back to the Mueller and Chavit um, uh, Kasman project uh, that you know, identified these macro structural um, characteristics, um, in, in, in a theoretical way, it relied very heavily on um, a distinction, kind of an ideal type distinction between what was called an organizational space, um, which was often identified with France, and what was called a credential space that was often identified with Germany. And so again, some history. Where did this, where did this identification come from? Where did these words came, come from? So they came from actually a very important book at the time uh, that was, I think, published in 1983 by Maurice Cellier and Sylvester, who were three French um, scholars, I'm not even sure if they were sociologists, they wrote a book called The Social Foundations of Industrial Power. So then you might say, what does this title mean, The Social Foundations of Industrial Power? Okay, so you've got to put yourself back in Europe of the 70s when they did this research, you know, and you had the war, and the war, you know, it destroyed Germany, but it also more or less destroyed France, I mean, it destroyed the European economies. Uh, and the, the United States was left standing and the rest of the world was not. And, you know, and Europe had to rebuild itself, you know, with help from the U.S., et cetera. Uh, and these industrial powers reemerged. So there's the industrial power. And then the question that they were asking is, well, what's the social in the sort of what the physical foundation of these industrial powers was technology. So they asked the question, what was the social foundation of these industrial powers, these emerging industrial powers? And that we can call human capital, people, right? And, and, but then, and they did this case study of uh, two or three um, manufacturing industries in France and in Germany. They looked at heavy manufacturing and they looked at like continuous process manufacturing, like, you know, chemicals kinds of things, petrochemicals. Uh, and they came to the conclusion that, you know, France is a organizational space that where the key issue is is stratification, is hierarchy. It's how much education did you get? And based on that, you got assigned to different kinds of jobs, and then the organization trained you. Whereas Germany was a credential space, i.e., you learned how to be a car mechanic or a hotel manager, or you know, we had a no, we had a few au pairs when our kids were young, and one of them, um, three of them were German, uh, and, you know, Birte, after she left, went to a Fachhochschule, which is a four-year applied university in Germany, to get a degree in technical translation. 
Now, in the U.S., there are no degrees, as far as I know, in technical translation. And if some company wanted to hire someone to translate between English and Japanese or Chinese or German or whatever, they'd find someone who know the, knew those languages and they'd say, translate this stuff. And Beata, of course, knew English because she had lived in the United States for a year. But she had to go to school for four years to learn technical translation so that then when these big German companies wanted, you know, they wanted like, you know, the American manuals in German or Microsoft's manuals in German, they knew they were translated correctly because she'd spent four years learning the words, the technical words so to translate. Okay. Um, but, you know, we showed in this, but, and the presumption was that, you know, that this, that this, this distinction created an ideal type dimension that the Casman project was, you know, partly organized on. Um, and so when we did this project, we, you know, we learned and showed that, you know, that this distinction oversimplified um, the difference. We looked at France, Germany, and the U.S., which we're going to talk mainly about today, uh, and it oversimplified both in the cross-section and historically, and I'll talk a little bit about the historical paper today, too, in the sense that, you know, we discovered that, you know, that France and Germany weren't as different as we expected them to be based on this scheme. And much of the difference that we saw was compositional, and I'll say a little more about what that means as the talk goes on, is rather than structural. Um, and that there was all this internal heterogeneity in these countries um, when you looked at their credentials. And we discovered that, you know, France actually had stronger linkage between education and occupation than does Germany for many educational outcomes. Um, and as I just said, can, countries can and do differ both in structure and in composition. So what is it, so uh, if I say a country has like high linkage strength, whatever that means, the question is how can that happen? So it can happen for structural and for compositional reasons. So for structural reasons, it can happen if the, if the school leaving outcomes, diplomas, credentials, certificates, whatever they are, link generally linked strongly with the occupational structure in the sense that people with those end up in predictable positions, that's structural linkage. Okay? A country can also have high linkage strength in compositional terms if their occupational structure is dominated by jobs that link strongly with the educational system. So that people in that country disproportionately are, I'll say, majoring in, if you like, or are in fields of study that link strongly relative to another country where lots of people are in things that link weakly. That could create high linkage strength in one country relative to another for purely compositional reasons. And of course, in reality, both of these things can be, can be going on. And then, moreover, the differences between Germany and France have themselves been changing since 1970, and I'll say a little more about that later in the talk, but this became a question that we wanted to make sense of when we saw the AGS results, and it was like, France and Germany aren't so different, so what's going on? So did, and indeed, then we went back and read the Mueller and Chavit volume in detail in the chapters, and looking at the details of the chapters about France and Germany, they didn't seem as different as the theoretical material. You know, often it's our way of looking at the world that shapes how we see the data uh, as the theoretical material. Uh, and it was like, so did Maurice and I get the story wrong in the beginning? Um, or had France or Germany changed to, in some sense, converge? So that became a question for us, and as it, and luckily, as I'll say more, you know, in a, in a few minutes, it turns out that in both France and in Germany, unlike in the United States, there has been an interest for a long time in um, keeping track of people's fields of study. So, and it's not surprising in Germany, but it is actually surprising in France, given that it's organizational space. So who cares about field? That doesn't matter. But it turns out that there are these surveys that were done in France that the, 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 uh, the labor force surveys of France going back to the 80s kept track of field of study. And then there was another set of surveys that were done back into the like 1970 or maybe even earlier that also kept track of this information. 
Uh, and in Germany, there's this thing called the microcensus. For those that, you know, there's a 1% sample that's done, and that's been going on since the early 90s. But in 86, there was a census in Germany. And in 1970, there was a census in Germany. And they also kept track of these things. So that then enabled us to then go all the way back to find out what was going on. And I'll say a little bit about that later, OK? Well, so you know, the, the AJS paper we wrote is a kind of a research program paper. It's like, you know, this is the right way to think about things, we asserted. And if you think about the things this way, it raises a whole set of research questions that thinking about it this way can answer. Uh, and we gave some illustrations in that, um, in, the, in the AJS paper, okay? At the same time, you know, we, you know, we knew, so to speak, and we asked ourselves that, you know, you come up with a, like a new frame for looking at things, that the so what question has to be answered, right? Like, what is this new frame useful for? So what if there's, if, if there's something called linkage strength and if it's at the credential level and if there's heterogeneity in countries, so what? Does it matter? Um, and so that's what the ASR paper, you know, has begun uh, to address. So, but then the question is, if it matters, why would it matter? Okay. So, and that's getting into mechanisms. So we're not going to talk about mechanisms today. But you know, at least we want, we want some conjecture as to why it's plausible that it would matter. Okay. And I think it is plausible that it would matter. Uh, and so, you know, one conjecture is is that stronger linkage may raise productivity and therefore wages through more efficient matching of workers to jobs that they're, that they're trained for. It's plausible that if it's easy to find the well-trained people for, you know, for jobs, that the people in the jobs are better trained and they're more productive. And then and they would, uh, in, a, in a world in which workers have some power, they would share some of that gains through higher wages. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, Asimoglu, Darren Asimoglu, the, you know, the well-known economist at MIT, has argued in some, you know, interesting papers um, not talking about linkage per se, but that, you know, that countries differ in the mix of, in their industrial mix, okay? And the question is, like, why do they differ in the industrial mix? And in particular, you know, you know Germany is a very export-oriented country, and, you know, what, are the, what, are, what, is, what does the German economy specialize in? It specializes uh, in, you know, in high-level in, 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 in high engineering stuff, you know, Fancy engineering is what the Germans are good for. And so why did the Germans specialize in high in fancy engineering? Well, Asimoglu argues because they got well-trained workers. So if you have well-trained workers, you know, then you can say, well, we won't make Fords, we'll make Mercedes. Because we can do that. Okay? Uh, and so stronger linkage may allow employers to adopt technologies that in combination with trained workers are more productive. And then, you know, it may also be the case there is, you know, that stronger linkage may create solidarity, worker solidarity, which may raise bargaining strength and therefore wages. So there's both social and, you know, um, technical reasons why linkage might matter for wage outcomes. Or in other words, structure may influence the returns to a specific quality of match as well as influence the probability of attaining a good match. In other words, what we're saying is structure may matter not just because of its impact on matching, but also the consequences of matching may be affected by, um, uh, by structure. And then, you know, moreover, the varying measures of match quality are hardly perfect. If you think about this at all, the question of like, how do you decide whether somebody is well matched to their job, their skills are well matched to their job, okay? It, you don't have to think about it for more than three or four minutes before you realize this is actually a really hard question. Right? And why is it a hard question? It's a hard question because skills are multidimensional. And jobs make use of multiple skills, and people have multiple skills. And so to say somebody's well matched or poorly matched is not, you, you know, it's not straightforward. Those, those of you who know ONET, going out, you know, ONET is this thing. The employment service used to run in the Labor Department. I think they um, subcontracted it out. You know, but it's like, you know, you want to, you're, I don't know, 18, 22, whatever age you are, you want to know, like, career is what kind of job should I do? You got to own it. And, you know, it shows you zillions of jobs and, like, what skills do they require? And zillions of skills, right? And so how do you get these skills? And just, it's like detail. It's like lots of, so then if you ask the question, ah, so what does it mean to well match? Right? It's, it's not, it's not too easy. Okay. So, 
you know, and because of that, the linkage structure may in fact convey important information about the average quality of matches wholly apart from whatever one's measure is of matching. Whether one's measure is like normative, like the scholar figures it out, or whether you ask people. You know, the remarkable thing about Germany, going back to Jim Woody's work, is, is that based on how we understand the country works, like most everybody should be well matched. Because you can't not be well matched. Because you can't be a hotel manager without a certificate in hotel managing. Because you can't make pastries at the bakery without having the credential to make pastries, which is why you go into a German bakery and it's always good and it's always the same. I mean, to a first approximation, because people learned how to make, you know, whereas you go in this country and you have crap pastries and wonderful pastries and this kind of pastry and that kind of pastry. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not, not too much, okay? Um, and, you know, so link construction may convey inf information about the average quality. So then the question about unemployment risk, okay? So, you know, a core argument of the Caspian project was that greater vocational specificity reduces unemployment risk during the school to work transition, which is what they really focused on was the early part of the life course. And then you ask the question, but are there trade-offs? So there's Eric Hanischek, a well-known economist at Stanford, has this paper that, um, you know, has been around for a while in working paper form, and then it was published in, the, I think, the Journal of Human Resources in 2017. And it embodied this, I would say, standard view by, you know, a lot of people, if I were to characterize these alternative views, that strong vocational systems come at the cost of labor market flexibility and higher unemployment risk in the later career. And they asserted that that's what they found. They did a study across a lot of European countries. And they looked at the employment of older workers. And they classified these countries in a kind of Caspian kind of way. That is, they classified each country as to whether it has a strong vocational system or not. And what they found was that countries that had stronger vocational systems had higher unemployment rates in later work career. Okay. Now, I mean, th there are the reasons why this could be problematic because one of the things that could drive unemployment, for example, is like disguised unemployment transitioning to retirement. It could be a function of welfare systems. Welfare variables weren't in the analysis, and they're correlated with whether there's vocational specificity. You know, so there are issues, but the thing we're focusing on here is, is that it was a, it was a country-level analysis that was identifying a macro characteristic of a country. Okay? Um, and the question then is, what happens when we assess linkage strength at the level of specific credentials? So, um, okay, so on the slide, there's a summation there. So there's a translation issue, uh, but this won't be a big problem. It's not a lot of math here. So where our focus is on entropy-based measures of linkage strength, okay? Uh, so, you know, Entropy is this idea of expected information gained from data, i.e. the unpredictability. Um, uh, and there's a formula for entropy. Uh, and if we were thinking about entropy in terms of, let's say, educational categories, though we could also think about it in terms of occupations, one would ask the question is how much entropy is there in an educational system? Um, and that formula where you have to put a summation sign over there, okay? that entropy is at a minimum when everyone has the same educational outcome. Because when you have the same educational outcome, the information value of knowing what your education is is nil. Because I know what it is. You're in the same category, okay? And if, every, and if, if the distribution is like um, everybody has, if, if every education state is the same proportion, that's maximum. Because then you, you, don't, you can't guess well, okay? Uh, and, you know, and there are entropy-based segregation measures that have been developed, okay? And what we're doing basically is a segregation analysis applied in a different context. Uh, and there's, um, and, you know, Reardon Firebo and Moran Ruiz Castillo, there's the um, mutual information index, there's the M, there's the H, there's the H star. So we're going to be using the M. Um, and I'm afraid all the math is messed up in the translation, but you don't, we don't need it, okay? I'll tell you, okay? So our measure of linkage strength at the country level is the M, okay? Uh, and what is the, uh, and the M is the average reduction in occupational entropy between its overall value, 
in its value for workers with a specific educational level and field of study. In other words, how much better can you predict somebody's occupation if you know their field of study? And if you think about that, how, do you imp how much can you improve the, the, the prediction for each, field, for each level field of study, we'll call it the level field, and you average across all of those, okay? That's a segregation measure, okay? And it's, segre it's the question of how much, how segregated are people with the same education in, not in, not in neighborhood space, not in schools, but in occupation space. If they're highly segregated, then it's very predictive, okay? And the M is high. Um, and then there's a local linkage um, strength measure, which is the extent to which, um, and again, there's summation signs here if you want to see the math, or I can send the real slides uh, later, okay? That it's the extent to which the occupational distribution of workers in educational category G, any one of them, differs from the overall um, distribution. Uh, and <coughs> It turns out that the M for a, a country is just equal to the, it's just the weighted sum of these local linkage measures. Okay, so local linkage is telling you, you know, how, um, how different is <coughs> occupational distribution relative to the overall occupational distribution for people with a particular educational category. You compute that for every one of the categories. <coughs> You sum those up, weighted by the size of the categories, you get the M. And as it turns out, you can do exactly the same thing on the occupations, and you sum that up, and you get the M as well. Okay. So the local linkage strength, which is at the level of pathways, has a, a, a clear, strong, easy to understand relationship with the overall M. Um, and these measures are also decomposable for studies of difference and change. Uh, one of my students, Benjamin Elbers, has uh, written a, a paper that, if you're interested in these kinds of things, you should read, called The Method for Studying Difference in Segregation Levels Across Space and Time. Um, and so what does it look like in practice? So this is a, a, a chart from the AJS paper, which is comparing the total linkage strength in France, in Germany, in the United States. Um, high is more linkage. Uh, this actually is decomposing uh, the total linkage strength into that part of it that's between major occupations by level, between minor occupations within major occupations by level, between major occupations by field within level, <coughs> and between minor occupations within major occupations by field within level. And we don't need to pay attention to that, but I mean, again, you can learn things about why the M is what it is. You know, but as you can see, um, you know, Germany is the highest, it has one as the total linkage strength, France is at three quarters, and the United States is about 0.4, okay? Um, and the question of what that means, I'll get to in a second, okay? But here is a graph that looks at the local linkage scores for the United States, France, and Germany um, for all these fields of study, which are these fields of study, these are the two-digit ISCAD fields, okay? Um, you can absorb what those are, sort of what you would come up with if you were, okay? Uh, and it's, and these are being measured at all these different levels of education, and again, these are ISCAD levels, and they're sitting over here, okay, from um, so there's lower secondary, there's different forms of upper secondary, depending upon whether it's heading to the labor market or heading up, um, uh, to uh, post-secondary education, and there's lower tertiary and upper tertiary, okay? And the thing to note here uh, is that there's, and down here it's, um, well, this is all messed up too. Uh, the real slide would say is one, two, three, four. I guess one, one, two, three, four. Okay, so these scores are spread between zero and four, um, and you can see there's a lot of spread. Okay, and and if you wanted to stare at this for a long enough time, you could readily convince yourself, uh, and I could show other pictures that would even make that clearer, that these particular. Um, Icons are in different places in different countries for the same level and the same and the same field. Okay. 
Um, so the question is, that what do these numbers mean? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it turns out that they have heuris there are heuristics that can make ready sense of them. Okay. Uh, so with our harmonized categories, so what we're using here is we're using two, we're using three-digit ISCO occupations, roughly 100 of them, like 90 or something, and we're using those ISCED categories uh, for level and field, meaning that there's like 60 to 90 categories per country, okay? So with these harmonized categories, the proportion of workers with a given educational outcome in the three most common occupations is roughly equal to a one-fifth of the linkage score plus 0.2, okay? Which turns out to be, like, you know, useful, so that if the local linkage score is 0.4 for some category, uh, then that means that 0.2 plus 0.2 times 0.4 are roughly 28% of the workers with that educational outcome are predicted to be in one of the three most common occupational destinations for that educational outcome. Whereas if the, if the linkage score, instead of being 0.4, is 2, then it's roughly 60% are in those three categories. And if it was point, and if it was 1, it's 40% are in those categories. Okay? So when you, like, you know, if you go back then to this picture, and you say, so what does it mean for Germany to be 1 and the United States to be 0.4? It means that the weighted average of these linkage scores in, 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 in so on average, like 40% of Germans in a random category are in one of the three most common occupations for it. Whereas in the United States, it's only 28%. And in France, it's in between. We can easily compute that. So now these numbers get some meaning. And I can then, I'll show you, like, in terms of the specific illustration. So this, these are uh, three um, educational outcomes in the German context. So this is a health degree uh, for 5A, B, or 6, which means uh, upper tertiary, or well, lower tertiary, or upper tertiary. And this is math statistics, 5A, B, 6. And this is health at the secondary level, OK? And so health at the tertiary level in Germany has a linkage score of 3.42. So that's a high score, OK? Well, what are the three most common occupations that people with that, with that outcome, what do they do? Well, 86% of them are health professionals. 3.2% are health associate professionals, and 1.2% are nursing and midwifery. So you can see the linkage is very, you can see what it means to say this very strong linkage. Okay? Math and statistics, it's 2.07, so that's not as strong. My heuristic was 60%, okay? But it's still strong, you know, relative even to Germany, which the average overall is one. And then you see 41% are mathematicians and statisticians, and statisticians, 16% are computer associate professionals, and 7.2% are architects and engineers. So it's still strong linkage, not as strong as this. And then we'll go to health at the secondary level, which again is 1.49, which is still strong linkage, okay? But this is at the secondary level as opposed to at the tertiary level. And now we see that 27% are personal care workers, 25% are nursing and midwifery, and 9.6% are, uh, are, um, are associate, um, uh, associate professionals in social work. Okay, so the scores are meaningful, okay? Um, now, and that heuristic wouldn't work for a different category system. If we had like 300 occupations, in 200 categories, one would need a different heuristic. You could compute it, so to speak. It wouldn't be hard to compute it, and then you, but, um, but for this system, uh, this works. Uh, and if you looked at those scores in detail, you'd see the variation. Um, there's variation across level fields and across countries. You know, categories that correspond well to specific occupational licensing requirements, not surprisingly, have strong linkage scores. Computing, engineering, law, architecture, business administration, health, mathematics, and statistics, and the physical sciences. These are all examples of fields that correspond to various professional occupations. And in almost every case, there's stronger linkage higher in the system than lower in the system, because the higher in the system, they're becoming professionals. Okay, so there's a, you know, there's a, there's a, a pattern here, okay? But at the same time, the relative linkage strength of these and other fields is clearly varying across these countries, varying you know, across the categories and across the countries. Um, 
And you know, the footnote that I said I would you know, give you is that the French-German differences have changed over time. Okay, so we have this paper that's uh, under uh, second review at Salt Forces. I'm not gonna jinx it, I think. I'm confident. Um, that is this analysis of change between 1970 and 2010. Um, and so we have all these data points. Uh, and you know, there's and there's a couple of things that we learned. So you know, Maurice Sely and Sylvester in their analysis, as I may have mentioned, and now I forget if I did or not. Interestingly, um, their the system came out of their analysis of male workers. They ignored women in their study. Uh, this the German and Germany and France are so different. Well, their the difference amongst men is much bigger than the difference amongst women. Okay. Uh, and and that hasn't changed. Um, and you know, and the other thing is that, uh, as it turns out, that this difference between France and Germany is, you know, it's essentially compositional. Um, and France, and this, so in both countries, linkage is increased, but it's increased for different reasons. Uh, that in in the France, so this here is showing how the change, how these countries have changed from 1970 to like 2010. And you see most of the changes in the marginals. Um, in terms of structure, Germany hardly changed at all, you know, because Germany has these rules and they sort of, um, whereas, you know, France is interesting. You know, France had like, big increases in the marginals and corresponding decrease in the structure. And so what was going on in France? It's not that there weren't, you know, people that were in vocational categories that were, um, and they, they existed in France. It's just that most of the workforce weren't in those, weren't getting those school leaving credentials. Those school leaving credentials were controlled by the Ministry of, of Commerce, not the Education Ministry. Uh, and you know, and they were being you know trained for specific jobs, and they were getting those jobs. And what happened in France over all those years was a big expansion, a big reduction in the number of people that were unskilled, and a big expansion in people that were in specific fields. But that was taking place at um, I want to say the cost, the con simultaneously structural linkage strength was going down. And so, you know, you have this interesting, like, sort of irony that, you know, that Maurice et al., you know, they, they saw this difference, but it was here and not there, but this difference wasn't structural, even though they described it in structural terms. It was a compositional difference between the countries. Okay, so, you know, the, the, the answer to the, you know, so what question I said I would give you. So, we have data for three countries we're analyzing here, the United States, Germany, and France. We're combining a set of data sets in the United States in order to get information on field of study, uh, as well as um, earnings and unemployment. For Germany, we have the microcensus. For France, we have um, the labor force surveys, the enquête uh, emploi. And um, we're only studying holders of occupational certificates or lower upper tertiary degrees in the United States. We're excluding the secondary workers, secondary school educated workers in the United States. Because in the American system, those people don't have fields of study in general. They don't have fields of study as reported in, um, in, in data sets. You know, they're like Ohio has uh, a system of like, of senior level uh, secondary schools that people can go to even after they graduate from secondary school to get vocational certificates. But these things are specialized and not standardized in general secondary school isn't vocational in the United States. So um, we're, we're looking at the United States at the tertiary level, and we're looking at France and Germany at the secondary level. Okay. Looking at uh, gross earnings for 18 to 65 year olds, fully full-time employed individuals, converted to a monthly measure, um, because it's hard to measure wages for part-time employees in these three countries. Uh, and um, we've imputed, but highly accurately their, um, their, uh, their earnings in Germany. 
So we limit analysis to cells with at least 100 cases in the educational level field. We do that for technical reasons, because with the segregation measure, the more sparse the data is, the more segregated people seem. So sparseness bias begins to come into play. And so um, though it actually is, it happens at much lower than 100, um, it happens at lower than 50, but this is what we did. And we have some supplementary analyses which drop it to 50 and we get the same answers. And we're using 90 harmonized ISCO 88 categories, and then we're using 66 categories um, in France, 82 for Germany, 52 for the United States, which are just a question of like which categories have people in them. Okay. Um, we measure whether a worker's credential matches their occupation. So we compare the observed frequency for a particular education, occupation cell, with what would occur if field of study wasn't predictive of occupational destination. So look at the ratio of what the data are showing relative to an independence assumption as the measure of matching. So we basically, we, we, um, we look at the, uh, the 10 most common occupational destinations for each of these level field combinations. And then we take the ratio of the, of the cell count in the, in the um, in the, in, in the contingency table defined by that by the fields and we compare what it is what it would be under independence that gives us our our, our matched categories um, we use the top two we use the top three we use the top four in order to see whether it matters it turns out it doesn't um, and then we have two kinds of analyses where we're looking at the effective linkage on wages so we do a within country analysis and so we do a between country analysis. Okay, the within country analysis is so we regress the log of wages on age, age squared, education level, the local linkage score for the for the level field, whether they are in a, whether they match well and the interaction between their matching and local linkage. Okay? Um, that's going to give us an analysis for each country, uh, which is you know, interesting, and there is a uh, there is a, a limitation of that because the limitation is that we're imagining that these fields of study only matter in the sense that they have more or less linkage. Okay, whereas in reality, people can like other things can matter about a field of study than linkage. So we then do a between country analysis. Uh, in the between country analysis, we basically stack the data, okay? We simplify the ISCID levels a bit in order to make them exactly comparable across the countries. We stack the data sets, and so we regress the log of wages on the same variables, but now we have level field as fixed effects. And so now what we're doing is we're comparing the pay of someone in a particular, with a particular level field in France, with someone in Germany, with someone in the United States, if it's at the tertiary level, according to the strength of the linkage and the question, which isn't always ranked the same as I showed you already before. So the question is, for any of these categories, is the relative pay higher when the linkage is stronger? Okay, and as I said, it's identified because of that, take that what I showed you before. Okay. Um, and country effects capture currency and price differences um, and differences in average level of wages, okay? And I can't show the equations because they're not working in the translation, but they're what I just said. Okay. Um, and then we do the same thing on unemployment. Okay, so for the wage analysis, in the first instance, we use just full-time workers, as I said, because of the difficulties of, of identifying the number of hours of part-time workers. Though in a, additional analyses, we add the part-time workers in, it doesn't matter. Um, but for the unemployment analysis, we add the part-time workers and the unemployed to the full-time database, and then we ask the question, what's the probability of being unemployed as a function of the strength of linkage for one's particular educational category, the level field? Okay. So now we get to results. Um, Uh, so first we do the between education within country analysis. I'm not going to try to interpret all these numbers, but you can just sort of see with stars, linkage strength matters. In a matched occupation matters. Um, and there and, and the interaction is 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 typically there. 
We did an analysis for France at the secondary level, France at the tertiary level, Germany at the secondary level, Germany at the tertiary level. The United States, we looked separately at the people who only have up to four years of education and those that have four or more. And the reason we separated those out is because the American system is a bit unique in that so much of our tertiary education system happens at the graduate level, master's degrees and various kinds of professional degrees, whereas in the European context, you get those things in college. You wanted to see whether that mattered. Um, and, and so we'll show you wage contrast. So these wage contrasts are looking at the, the relative effect of being matched versus not matched as a function of linkage strength. And so this is at the secondary level. This is France versus Germany. Uh, and this is at the tertiary level, and this is all the countries. And so what you see is that in France, at the secondary level, linkage strength doesn't matter, but it clearly matters in Germany. So again, what is this? This is the, you can either think of it as the bonus or the penalty for being matched. So what this is saying is that in Germany, there is a strong bonus and or a strong penalty for having a particular educational credential and being in the right occupation relative to having that same credential and being in the wrong occupation. Okay? Um, and in, in France, there is a, uh, it, at the secondary level, it doesn't matter very much, but at the tertiary <coughs> level, it's for all three countries, whether or not you take only up to four years or all the uh, um, all the tertiary workers in the United States that the, the bonus for being matched rises with linkage strength the penalty for being not matched rises with linkage strength so linkage strength is clearly having an impact on the distribution of, of wage and earnings outcomes um, and so now I'm going to show you the same thing, but now we're, it's a fixed effects model at the, at the level field. So now the comparisons that we're making are comparisons within the same level field category. We're not comparing across categories with this kind of strong assumption that all that matters about the field is how strongly it links. Uh, and, um, and so this is a lot of little pictures that are looking at predicted log earnings. The blue line uh, is for um, matching. Uh, the, red the red line is if you don't match. And this is looking at the France-German comparison for secondary workers. This is the France-German comparison for tertiary workers. This is all three countries. If you look, uh, if you exclude the graduate degrees, uh, and this is if you include the graduate degrees. Um, and, you know, and across all of these pictures, what, you know, the general, and, and, and these are men up at the top, and these are women. Uh, those are the younger men, the older men, the younger women, the older women. So we split the data into lots of pieces. And these pictures aren't all identical, but the general story that's coming from them is, is that being matched is better. Uh, that and in, in general, uh, you're getting a benefit from linkage. So there's a structural and an individual that, uh, effect that's coming from these. Um, uh, so both of these things matter. So then let's look at the effect on, on unemployment. So I've already told you that um, you know, Hanacek did this analysis at the level of countries and came to the conclusion that you know, vocational educational systems produce higher levels of un unemployment. So we're going to look at the effects of linkage on unemployment as a function of linkage strength. Uh, and we're going to do it both and this within country between field analysis and this within field between country analysis. Okay. Uh, and so this is the, uh, uh, the marginal predicted um, proportion that are unemployed as a function of linkage strength. Okay, this is France, Germany, secondary, France, Germany, United States, tertiary, France, Germany, tertiary, and um, France, Germany, United States, tertiary, including the graduates. 
And the general story for all of these is, is that as linkage strength increases, the probability of unemployment is going down. This is the within field between country analysis. And if we break it out by age, because this is really the test for Hanischak's argument, which is maybe this is true for young workers, but it wouldn't be true for older workers. So here we have the marginal predicted effect of linkage strength. In other words, increase in linkage strength by a standard deviation on unemployment. Uh, and the, so this square is men, younger men, the triangle, so these the, the brown, I guess, is that color? Okay, so brown is men, and the square is younger men, the triangle is older men, the circle is younger women, the diamond is older women. Uh, and so the Hanischek prediction would be that these triangles would be up here, they'd be above zero, and the diamonds would be above zero. But what you find instead is that most everything is below zero. That is, that linkage is having a protective effect against unemployment at younger ages, at older ages, for men and for women. Um, so which is, um, linkage is good. Okay. So then we do a variety of sensitivity analyses. I think I mentioned some of these a little bit in the talk. We used the top three or top four occupations as a definition of matched occupations. We get the same result. These are in an online supplement. If anybody wants to look online, you can find them. We included part-time workers in the earnings analysis. It doesn't matter. There was a question by reviewers about the fact that you know the financial crisis had happened and we were using data that was in the financial crisis. Does that matter? We can't do this analysis for the US before 2009 because that's when they started the fields of study. So we took post-crisis data for the United States. 2015 took pre-crisis data for France. These things don't matter. Um, what about people who are in more than one occupations? You can't see that in the United States, but you can see it in France and Germany. That doesn't matter. Um, what about the age range? We change the age range in various ways. That doesn't matter. Um, there is the, there, you know, so one sort of like, you know, sophisticated question might be, well, what if the selection processes into these different fields are different in different countries? So in other words, what if general ability somehow matters? I mean, it does, okay. And what if it, it? What if it's driving people differently into different fields? Um, so we we can't answer that like definitively because we haven't got cognitive tests in the labor force surveys and the micro census. But we do have them in the PIAC. Okay. Now PIAC doesn't have as many fields. It has like nine fields, I think, instead of the twenty. But we can put controls in for cognitive ability in the model. And it's positive. Its effect on wages is, is, is positive. It doesn't change the fundamental results that I've shown you here. So the results seem like fairly robust. Okay. Um, you know, leading to the conclusion that you know linkage structure, linkage strength matters for the wage distribution, and generally in a positive way. It generally increases wages. It generally reduces unemployment risk, including for older workers. Or if I wanted to phrase it more abstractly, the institutionalized pathways between the educational system and the labor market affect the structure of inequality and the life chances of individual workers, which is all sort of implying that you know we'd be better off if there's more linkage strength uh, than there is now in the United States, for example. Okay. You know, so then just a couple more words about next steps. So we're now applying this approach to all the European countries and the European labor force surveys, which creates you know interesting, you know, uh, uh, issues, you know. So we're asking the question: How do they? So the first thing we want to find out is like, how do they differ in terms of the structure of linkage? And then we want to find out how do they differ in the consequences of linkage? And then we want to find out whether the effects of linkage depend upon the structure of linkage. So what do I mean by structure of linkage? I mean the question of like, you know, why would countries be different in their linkage strength? So there's these differences are partly, as I've already explained, are partly in the marginals and partly in the structure. So that German-French difference that you saw in the beginning, a lot of that is compositional. The German workers are more likely to be trained in those level fields that tend to link strongly with the labor market. 
which you might think of in some other ways, the export-oriented manufacturing, high, high uh, technology manufacturing economy of, the, of, of Germany. Okay? So if you're going to compare 27 countries, you've got to like, pull out the marginal component. Not because it's not important, but you've got to, like, you've got to isolate it. And so we, we, well, first we do marginal adjustment of all these um, local linkage um, tables. Okay? These are basically contingency tables of level fields by occupations. You see, you know, you hit a proportional fitting to like, adjust the marginals. Once you've adjusted the marginals, then you've got the structural component. Now you've got a decomposition of the marginal and the structural. Um, so then the question is, so then you'll see structural differences. The question is, where do these structural differences come from? Okay. Well, those of you that are you know, familiar with uh, social mobility, vast social mobility literature, long-standing social mobility literature um, uh, in sociology, which is focused on you know, positions as class positions, so they're social classes, and the question of like, you know, what is the amount of mobility from parents to children, from fathers to sons, from uh, parents to um, fathers to daughters, parents to daughters, etc. cetera. Uh, and, you know, and if you know this literature, you know, then you know, you know that once upon a time, there were, back in the 50s, you know, sociologists were doing mobility studies and constructing mobility indices. And then it was sort of realized that these indices mixed up composition and structure because countries can differ in the marginals. And so that was one of the great sort of uh, values of uh, log linear models is they allowed you to separate the marginals from the structure. Uh, and then there was a paper that became a very well-cited paper by Featherman, Jones, and Hauser uh, in the uh, early 70s which sort of realized and reported that most of the difference over time and probably across countries comes from differences in the marginals, not from differences in the table. It doesn't mean there aren't any differences in the table, but that's what's called relative mobility. Okay? And so then there were all these studies of relative mobility. And uh, there's the you know, well-known Goldthorpe and Erickson uh, book, The Constant Flux. And that was a study of differences in relative mobility across a set of countries. Uh, and one of the things they reported in that book was that there seemed to be something called the core model. That is, that when they fit this, you know, this model to this complex uh, contingency table, you know, they reported that, you know, it, roughly speaking, you know, you needed the same parameters for every country. And they called that the core model. And then the question was, well, so are there differences between the countries? And they reported, well, yes. So what are the differences? And the report, and they said the differences were in the strength of the association, but that these were all sort of scaling together, which led to this thing called the UNIDIF model, where you have the core model that you fit, and then either over time or across countries, you have a strength parameter. Um, but it appears that's not what's going on and the issue of linkage between education and occupation. So it's not going to be a single core model of linkage strength across countries. Countries are going to differ not just in the strength of, not in, they're going to differ in the patterns as well as in the strength. And so that's what we're in the process of doing right now is identifying the core patterns of which there's going to be more than one. And if you want to like motivate this, think Germany, in something that's not Germany, okay? And, you know, and that you, you can readily convince yourself that I'll bet these aren't all scaling the same way. Or think secondary education and tertiary education. So it's easier to imagine that to a first approximation, industrialized countries are the same in the way they organize tertiary education, maybe holding the US aside because it conflates graduate and professional degrees. But other than that, you might say, well, aside from that, it's plausible that the countries are sort of the same in the way they organize upper tertiary education, i.e. that health links more strongly than humanities, that these things are proportional. It's like a proportional model, okay? You know, like, you know, proportional hazards models. But, and that isn't exactly true, but I mean, it's plausible, okay? 
But it's probably less plausible to say that those countries are scaling in the same way, that the same proportionality is applying at the secondary level if one country has a strong apprenticeship system and the other has a weak one. Or in strong and weak can mean different things. So you know, the UK has, a, has a, um, uh, an apprenticeship system, but it doesn't like try to balance supply and demand. So that can create. So, that, so the, the question of the pattern, the pattern may vary by the level, okay? But once one has like identified the core patterns, then there'll be groups of countries, and within those groups, you have a unitif model where the pattern will be stronger or weaker. So you're gonna have the issue of the heterogeneity of the pattern, you're gonna have the issue of the unitif parameter, so to speak, strength, it's that pattern like applied strongly or weakly, and then the countries are going to be different on the marginals because they have a different occupational structure, a different educational system. And so that's what we're working on right now is developing a parsimonious representation of these country differences so that then we can do the analysis that we just showed you to find out like does it matter but you know now our interest is not just does linkage matter, but does it matter with what I'll now call a macro characteristic of the country, which is not vocational specificity or standardization or stratification, which not that those aren't important, but I think those are too um, too crude, so to speak, too preliminary. Okay, and so that's where we're you know going with this uh, right now, and we're you know we're um, uh, we have some. Uh, researchers in, in Australia that we're working with, and we have some researchers in Israel that we're working with. Israel, in particular, is an interesting country because we have all this cognitive test data uh, that is linked up to the register so that we can do the kind of analysis we did with PIOC, with, with we do it more, you know, with, with more cases and with better measures. Um, and yeah, so that's, I guess that's what I have to say. Uh, thanks, you've shared a lot of research with us. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, one goes back to the earlier part of your presentation, and uh, I wanted to make sure I understand what your empirical work can capture. So earlier on, particularly when you're talking about the Hanushek issue and so forth, you're talking about the quality of the match. And um, maybe you can say more about whether you're capturing quality of the match as well as the strength of the linkage. So intuitively, I can think of let's say a hypothetical example in which PhDs in economics uh, go into one or two jobs. Uh, they either become Wall Street analysts or they become uh, pastry chefs. Um, and I thought you said professors or finance. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, right? Or uh, people get associate's degrees uh, in uh, food preparation, become either Wall Street analysts or pastry chefs. And I could see a world in which, if linkage is perfect, everybody in one of those cells goes to the occupational cell. Um, in either direction, you could have perfect linkage. Um, but in one direction, by laughter, right, the, the presumed quality of the match is far better than the other. It, and I'm not sure whether your empirical work is capturing the quality of match in that sense is clearly there's wage returns but quality of match. And the second short question I have for you is is there a way to capture uh, in data that you now or will have access to job or occupation switching because I didn't hear you talk about that. So I didn't talk about let's go second to first okay so I didn't talk about occupational switching because the work we've been doing so far has been focused on creating these linkage measures as well as using them. Okay, so like the work in Australia, we're you know we're, we're applying uh, these analyses to the Hilda data, which would enable us to do what you did. Because once one has the measures, one can use them with the SIP, one can use them, and then one can look at issues of like switching, and one can ask the question you know as to whether linkage structure has an impact on. You know, on job mobility. Mm -hmm. So, if you're in a field that has weak linkage, it implies more job mobility over time. One might argue than in strong linkage. <coughs> so, if that's where we're going, 
it's not here because these are the big data sets where we're still like focusing on the issues of making sure we're measuring the linkage correctly, which you can't do. You couldn't do that in the HILDA or in the SIP, but you could take them from the microcensus and use them in the SIP. And indeed, I could imagine, you know, I, when, when and maybe it's already stabilized, I could imagine the Germans putting these measures in the SIP, for example. Okay. So that's the second. On the first, um, so as I said, there's like three different kinds of measures of matching of, 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 you know, at the individual level. So conceptually, we're clear that linkage strength is a structural characteristic, not an individual characteristic, okay? That if there's, you know, strong linkage between economics and the labor market, which probably means that they're either economists um, or finance people, they're probably not pastry chefs. Whereas an individual with an economics degree who's working in a bookstore is not well matched in that sense. So we're using a statistical criteria, okay? Um, none of these are gonna be perfect, which was my argument, you know, back at the beginning, because it's so multidimensional, okay? If you ask, if you have surveys or people tell you whether they're well linked, I don't know that I would believe them for comparative analysis, because like when the Germans say we're not well matched, it's in this context of credentials everywhere, right? And so they might mean something quite different than Americans. So I wouldn't want to use that. And so then one could say normatively, which means like you know, like you and I sit down with a giant occupational, you know, and we and we did do that. So, okay. So we did something that you know, I th it was more objective in some sense. Okay, but. It evolved over time because your example sort of illustrates that. So the, the first thing we tried was just trying to be statistical about this. Let's just compare cell frequencies to the model under dependence. And that will tell us something about the strength of association. Okay. Now, the problem with that is, is that there can be, like, Maybe pastry chefs. Maybe there. Maybe maybe economists like to be pastry chefs, and there aren't so many pastry chefs in the world. Okay, and so for totally other reasons, it turns out that the ratio of the cell free of the cell count to the expected cell count is huge for pastry chefs. So that's why we put a filter in that we only took the like the biggest occupations. For the it, you know there aren't that many pastry chefs who come out of uh, economics, in part because maybe there aren't so many pastry chefs. And indeed, the appendix to the paper has all the links. So you can, you can go out there and you can observe, and you can see whether the statistical results are equating to your normative criteria. Okay, so we're not worried about that, but it, you know, it also is the case that one can construct meshes of matches that are continuous. Because indeed, you know, so we did two, three, and four because we want to understand whether the results are basically robust. That doesn't mean there isn't some notion of a better or worse match, right? You first, and then. Oh, I just, yeah, enjoy your talk. I have a question about the strength of the linkage. A strong linkage also depends on the right amount of supplies, right? So if there is an adequate number of people in each profession or each school. So how does that differ, like Germany versus France and the United States, given that education systems are very different in terms of supply and demand? Well, so you're, um, there's a couple of different things. So when you, it is the case, and I, I can't unfortunately show it so clearly because the slides got so messed up in the translation. I thought PDFs had this property that, that couldn't happen, but um, uh, apparently not. Um, so I can't really show you on here, but the, the measures of linkage are not margin independent. You know, they are margin dependent, so therefore they do depend upon this. Um, but that's, but the, the advantage of this approach is it's so powerfully decomposable. And so by adjusting the margins to the same, we address the question that you're asking. So we're trying to find out why are these, you know, why is linkage strength different? And we see composition as one of the reasons, which gets into supply-demand issues. That's one of the reasons, 
why leakage strength could be different in one country than another. In other words, if one country lets anybody who wants become an engineer, but there's only so many engineering jobs, then the linkage can be pretty bad, right? Or anybody who wants to become a doctor, but you can't, like, so that would be bad linkage, but for, you know, but we can see it because we can decompose it. So that's the power of the system. So a really interesting talk, and yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about possible mechanisms here, and you know, a lot of the talk is about patterns, and implicitly, you know, in, in our Q&A and so on, the, the, the mechanism is kind of a career <coughs> mechanism. You create a pipeline, and if the pipeline takes you to the right place, you get good outcomes, right? And, but there are some other mechanisms that in theory, at least, could be working. And so right. I'm thinking, for example, about I'm your listening. unemployment results. Yeah. And you know, if what's happening is not primarily about people getting placed in jobs that are good, you know, that are good and lifetime jobs and they don't get unemployed, it's that people realize that they're stuck in this occupation, and so they mobilize occupationally and put pressure on the state to make sure that unemployment doesn't doesn't rise in those occupations. That's right. Different. Yeah. And so right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So yes. I, you know. So so you know. And and there also are things about how an educational system is organized that may also reflect things about what kinds of careers people want to have and about how much solicitude people put and how much pressure and how much emphasis they put on education as being the thing that ensures long term occupational stability no, and so on. And I you know and so I'm I'm wondering if there's you know if how much purchase your results give you on that kind of you know the more individualistic career model versus the more macro political economic model and you know, if you're thinking about doing any of the things with the cross-national comparison that might get at that and so on. Well, I mean, I think that it reveals it. In other words, what you just said, that question wouldn't be asked without this, mm -hmm. right? And, and indeed, if one found, if one could identify that on technical grounds, these people shouldn't be doing well, right? Or one could come up with direct measures of um, their of worker solidarity or whatnot that are connected to linkage. So I, that's, I think, you know, we described it in the AJS paper as a kind of a research program. There's all kinds of things you can do with this kind of analysis. But, you know, but just the other thing, just to comment, that was, I don't believe, I don't believe that specific and general skills are zero sum. Okay, and I think that's the conventional wisdom, right? That you've got specific training, you don't have any general training. And when you think about that a little, it, 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 it also gets conflated with this idea of vocational as like low education. So like if I said, oh, doctors are stupid, all they know is medicine, right? And you say, oh, I know some doctors, and they know how to read. They read novels. They, they understand. <laughs> you know, so you're searching, you're making, just because they have specific education doesn't mean they have, don't have any general education, too. But you know, you ask this question across the board, so to speak, okay? And I don't know that it's true that the tighter the linkage across countries, the less, the worse is their general math ability, the worse is their reading, the less whatever, whatever culture means. I mean, and that it indeed would be another interesting like paper to write. Which, because it may be that in fact you get linkage strength without losing general, which means that that's the reason that those workers are doing better because they didn't lose the general, but they also had the specific. John? Yeah, uh, so thank you. This uh, talk about linkages is something I've never thought about before, so it's raising new questions in my mind. Uh, what I'm what I have more in my background is the idea that the, the greater the structure of the situation, the, m the more it, it, it creates opportunities for some people, but disadvantages for other people. Right. Like it excludes people who don't have the right uh, background aren't going to get into that occupation. And maybe that's, in general, is better occupations that you don't get into if you don't manage to have the right background. So I'm thinking about it from the point of view of how uh, you mentioned doctors are professionals. They're not vocations, but they're professionals. Well, beauticians also want to be professionals. Right. They want to have professional credentials. They want to, you have to have a license. And, they, and if they can achieve it and create a strong link, this is the strong linkage, right. if they can achieve it, then they can exclude competitors right. from their yeah. occupation. And I, so I, it's very, but, right. but it's the opposite direction that, the, that, that those who have the capacity to 
exert pressure, create the stronger linkage, right. which therefore has advantages for them. So I'm just right. thinking about, should I think about this? It's a little bit both like ways. Mark's you think question. about it both ways. Okay. Should I think about it as something about careers and getting people connected to the right job, or should I think of it as systems of uh, structuring inequality? Yeah, and again, I think I think it's both at the same time. Well, historically, <laughs> it is how it works, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to build on both sets of questions um, because it strikes me your findings map on perfectly to the VOC literature, the varieties of mm -hmm. capitalism yeah. literature. Yeah, we right? talked about that in the AJS paper. Yeah, right. and, and you know, Germany and France are sort of classic coordinated capitalist economies in the U.S. is kind of liberal and disorganized, et cetera, and so you, you would expect more linkage. But part of the argument in that literature is that linkage is a function not just of having a vocational education system and a legacy of the guild system, but also having corporatism, you know, explicit right. state created structures to, to do the linkages, and then unionization. And that sort of goes to John's point, because in the US, the higher professions are really good at sort of patrolling the boundaries and creating scarcity and, and pushing up their wages. You know, we know that the AMA pretty much regulates who gets into the private. And the difference in Europe, of course, is that at the lower levels, that there are um, unions and there are corporatist structures that allows them to do some of this, which is why it doesn't produce an outcome that's as exclusionary as in the U.S. case. And so I, I guess you know the question is, with with your data, are there ways to capture some of those you know institutional variables, the corporatist stuff? The so I would say yes, but I would also say that our our work is revealing a weakness in the varieties of capitalism literature in the same way that it's revealing a weakness in the Kasman approach to comparative education because all of that work treated countries as units. Yep. And all of their variables, so to speak, were all macro level variables. It's so easy for us to drop, and I do it too, okay? Even though I'm conditioned, right? You drop into this presumption that France is all the same, Germany is all the same, and you tell these stories, and the stories sound so coherent, right? What they don't explain is this you know, that this massive heterogeneity that exists within these countries that we are treating as if they don't have any heterogeneity, they're just homogeneous. And indeed, if you look at like kinds of like quantitative analyses that the varieties of capitalism people have done, like Iverson and so, they, they take a bunch of countries and they come up with some VOC macro variables and they throw them in the equation to try to argue that you know that things are shifted systematically up or down for Norway versus Czech, you know Czech Republic or something like this, right? But the you know the problem is that's not it's not that it's wrong as a first approximation, but it's a it's not a great approximation to what's actually going on in those countries. So, I mean, that, and, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for these patterns, as I said, so we're looking at some level for macro level as well, but the real power of this is the fact that there's all this internal heterogeneity, even given these institutions, even in Germany. So. Last question. Okay, so thank you so much, and join us outside for a reception. Okay, thank you.